Okay, hi everybody. I just wanted to make a short video to conclude the topic that we started at the end of class today, which is about CUDA memcheck and how we can use it to debug our code. So we had this reduction code that we created in class. This code works under very specific circumstances and we were using CUDA memcheck to find out uh, why it didn't work in other circumstances. So just to check and recap where we were at, we have our sum reduction code here. Our sum reduction code uh, is basically going to use a thread to add two values of an array together. So we do that here. We add, you know, maybe element zero and element one together uh, or two and three, etc. cetera. Uh, and we do this uh, repeatedly, iteratively, until we get to a small enough number that we have our results. So then we store this result in our scratch buffer B. Uh, why is it called a scratch buffer? Well, it's just what we're using to write our temporary results into, and they will be, we will continuously generate temporary results until we have a, a final result. So uh, we'll come down here to our host code uh, you'll notice a few comments and changes just to make things a little more clear and to make this easier to look at. So we're going to start with i equals n and is the length of the array that we're trying to sum up. Uh, we want to divide by two every time because we're going to add up, every thread is going to add up two elements. So the size of our array B is going to be half um, what it was before every time. Uh, and so a few tiny changes. So we're going to use this blocks variable to do a temporary computation. So you'll notice previously we had i equals n uh, and we used i equals n and we had n threads, but we also had n elements. So n elements is too many. We're going to uh, create a buffer overflow and step outside of our array. So we, uh, use blocks and we divide this i by two uh, and then we divide it by the number of threads per block. Um, we do this i divided by two because it gives us the correct number of threads. However, n is the proper counter here. If we, if we used n over two, uh, we would stop one iteration too short. So we'll still use this to keep uh, pace and then we'll compute blocks separately. Uh, here's a slight change. Uh, here's an if statement that helps us in the case where blocks, or rather i, is not divisible by 128. i is not divisible by threads per block. Uh, so for example, if i is 129, we have 129 elements in our array. 129 divided by 128 equals 1. Uh, so one thread won't get created properly. So we do this test to see if i is divided evenly by threads per block. If it's not, then we'll create an extra block uh, so that we have enough threads. And we'll have to address that later too, because in this case, uh, we create an extra block, but we also create 127 extra threads. So we may still be in danger of a buffer overflow, and that's sort of what we're getting at here. Um, looks like maybe my slurm allocation ran out, so let's just get that back. And we'll take a quick pause here. Okay, so we have our slurm allocation returned to us. So let's take a look back at our files. We'll recover them real quick, and we'll delete our swap file. Uh, okay. So we'll look at, we'll pick up where we left off. So blocks plus equals one in the case where it doesn't divide equally. Uh, and then we will compute our sum reduction and we will still use this i over two. You could use a temporary variable to, to do this since we compute it three different times. Um, that's the correct way to do it, but oh well. So now that we do this, we can test our code real quick. So we'll build it, we'll run it. Uh, let's try a better example first. Let's try 1024. So if we run our case with 1024, we get the correct answer. 1024, 1024. Uh, and the key issue here is this code really doesn't work 
if it's not divisible by, if it's not a power of two. Um, or more specifically, if it's not divisible by 32. Uh, every power of two is divisible by 32 uh, if it's greater than 32. So it doesn't cause any problems. Uh, so we'll look at our case of 1,000, and you'll notice we have 14 errors. So uh, with Kuda Memcheck, you know, we will get this additional information that tells us if we have memory errors in our code. Uh, memory errors are bugs. Uh, they may or may not crash your code. It depends on what kind of memory error and how it happens and how the system treats memory. But every memory error is a bug. Uh, memory errors mean you're doing something that the lot that you didn't intend to. The logic of your code is incorrect, even if it generates the correct result. Uh, these are the kind of bugs that it will run correctly 10 times, and on the 11th time it will crash and you don't know. This is a very common kind of bug for applications you see in the wild. If you see um, games crash, if you see applications like Microsoft Word or your internet browser crashes, these kinds of things can cause that. Uh, and that can also be security issues. Anyway, uh, these error messages from CUDA Memcheck are very useful. CUDA Memcheck is useful to run even if you think your program is working, because like I said, if it finds something, you definitely have a bug, and it will help you figure out what it is. So we have an invalid global read of size four. That means we tried to read some memory of size four, probably an integer or a float, and it was out of bounds of the array that we were working in. Uh, and it tells us that this happens at line 26 in main in the sum reduction kernel. And it happens at thread 127 in block three. Uh, now, that doesn't tell us a whole lot about which kernel launch. We launch kernels several times, uh, but it gives us an idea, right? If we have 128 threads per block and we are block three, then um, you know 128 times three plus 127 gives us uh, you know a value between 256 and 500. It kind of tells us about where we're at. You can do the math on paper. Uh, long story short, we can look at main.cu line 26 and see what could have happened. Uh, so let's take a look at line 26. So of course it makes sense that this happened on line 26. This is the only place that we access global memory. Remember that A and B are global memory because they were allocated with CUDA malloc on the host. Uh, and basically we do something, something bad here. Um, most likely, uh, and again, we could do the math on paper if we wanted to, to figure out exactly which thread and exactly which index is out of bounds. But most likely we screwed up with our calculation that we did before. Notice I said here, we would probably have too many threads uh, if we were, you know, if we didn't divide ev e evenly by 128. So we can add a little guard up here uh, that tells us if we've done this correctly. So we'll add uh, an if statement and we will check, okay, if uh, our global ID is less than the length, basically the, the maximum number, the highest indexed thread that we wanted to allow, then you can do your operation as normal. Um, you know, threads that do not meet this requirement will not do anything at all. They will fall out the bottom of this statement. Um, you might think about thread divergence. You say, well, we said that wasn't very efficient, but in this case, it doesn't matter. You lose some parallelism, but you, weren't, you don't have work for that parallelism to do anyway. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. This just keeps us from having memory errors. So let's see if that did the trick. So we'll make real quick and we'll do an S run. And that solved our problem for now. Um, 
you know, CUDA memcheck is really useful for identifying these and finding where they come from. And it gives you the specifics you need to figure out exactly uh, where they come from and exactly what the problem is. Uh, so when you see these messages, you don't want to panic. You, you just want to read them carefully. Okay, it was a read, it was size four, it was on this line, it was by this thread in this block. Could I have possibly done some indexing wrong? Did I just write a bad statement on line 26? These kinds of things. Um, and you'll notice actually that, that this, it can only capture errors that actually occur. It can only capture memory errors if your test input is good enough to identify them. So I give you another example. We won't take the time to go through this um, because it just complicates things, but I will show you why or what. So let's try a harder example. Let's try 1050. 1050 doesn't, um, it doesn't really divide as well as uh, 1000. So when we try this, uh, you'll notice that we have 1050 here uh, and we sum up to 1040 here. So this isn't a memory error. This is actually the, the opposite. This is the other direction. We've made a logic error, but we've stayed in bounds. Um, but we still get the incorrect result. So this isn't a bug because we did a, an illegal memory access like the previous one. This is a bug because we've, we've made a mistake. Uh, I can tell you what this mistake is. Uh, basically, when we uh, do our calculation up here, we do this and we do this. Uh, what about the case where length equals eh, 501 is a, is a fair number? Um, well, then you'll have threads that can, um, Basically, you'll have a situation where threads can really only access two elements and you have an odd element out. So even just think about the case of three, we don't run our, our code with three, but um, in the case of three, we will do uh, A0 plus A1 and actually uh, A2 up here will fall out. Basically, we just won't remember to keep that value around. Um, we don't handle that case. We don't handle the case where we have a dangling element at the end in our reduction. Um, so it can, it can skew your result. It can give you bad results um, because we don't include all the data. Um, of course, it doesn't take very significant changes to this code to account for this case. You just have to account for the case where you are, you know, the last thread and you don't have, um, you know, you don't have a pair to work with. Uh, and so, eh, it's okay. We'll leave it alone for now. Um, but... Anyway, this has just been a summary kind of on how you can do some debugging, how you can do some CUDA mem check to help you find out if you have errors. Uh, it's very useful to do that. You might remember that you can do uh, printf in your kernels if you want to, to test some test cases. Uh, just remember that printf is really inefficient in the GPU. It will slow things down a lot. So you don't want to turn in code that has all of these printouts in it, but you can use them to debug. Likewise, you can use uh, CUDA GDB. Um, and if you want to use CUDA GDB, you can use it like any other GDB. So you, you give it some args. Um, it will read your symbols. It will tell you, you know, so it can help you find what lines of code you have. Uh, and you can, you can use run um, and run will run your code. In this case, we didn't do anything that caused a crash and we didn't set any breakpoints. 
Um, but you can set breakpoints. So we could do this. We could say break at line 26. Uh, we could run and then we'll get a breakpoint. You'll see now that we have uh, block zero, thread zero, on device zero, SM12, warp zero, lane zero, on grid one. And that tells us a lot about how our code is actually running. Uh, you might want to refer to the documentation for CUDA GDB because it has some additional uh, ways to addi additional commands that you can use to switch between blocks and threads. And so you can step and see what happens. Um, it's up to you and what kind of issues you're having and, and how you want to proceed. Anyway, um, I think that's it for today. So uh, thanks for watching, and I hope this is helpful to you when you do your assignments.